hello and welcome back to Cybos TV. Well, after a year of seemingly hysterical headlines about Bitcoin and so on, here at Cybos TV, we are determined to take a cool, calm and collected look at what's going on with virtual currency. So I'm delighted to be joined by Adam Ch Shapiro on my left, Prantry LLC. Thank you, Adam, for joining us this afternoon. Richard Brown to your left, Adam, from IBM UK. Welcome to the program, Richard. Um, and finally, Jerry Gates from the Canadian Payments Association. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, Adam, can the, the genie be put back in the bottle of these virtual currencies, or you know, has that bird flown, if I can mix my metaphors <laughs> horribly? <laughs> I think the bird or the genie <laughs> has flown, whichever it is. And I mean, there are two ways that the genie could be put back in the bottle in theory, one of which is if people don't adopt the technology, and um, the other of which is if um, someone, probably a government, shuts it down. And I think both are difficult. Um, I think it's hard for not to see the power in a technology that allows people to send um, money to each other whilst choosing whether to use a financial institution. And um, I think if we asked ourselves now um, the question of could you put email back in the bottle, which is a very similar peer-to-peer -peer system, um, um, people would look at me as if I had three heads. And I suspect in 20 years people will say that about this technology. Um, the other interesting question, of course, given all the concerns about money money laundering and consumer protection is, well, can it be stopped? And I think, again, the answer is no. Um, one of the reasons that um, the technology is hard to stop is that it's fundamentally based on open source software. It's um, based on a decentralized or distributed network of people contributing it. So unlike a traditional financial network, there's not one entity in the middle that if you shut it down, you can stop it. And so I think the question becomes, um, for banks looking at this, um, well, what are the implications of this? And for policymakers, well, how do we get to a position where we harness the power of this technology in a good way and not in a bad fight government? Um, um, let's try and use this in illicit sort of way. Absolutely, Richard. That brings me on to my question for you, which is, we've all, we, you know, it's tempting to discuss this issue in a purely negative way. Oh, can we stop? it you know can we put it back in the bottle but actually you know uh, paint me a picture of what the good stuff about these virtual currencies are you know if there is if there is benefits and positives what are they Sure. So I guess the first thing to say is that um, mainstream adoption of, of, of cryptocurrencies is, is still fairly modest, but we're already gaining some really quite intriguing insights as to how they're being used and, and what benefits they can bring. So just recently, the, the Boston Fed, so here, here in Boston, published a paper where they looked at the experiences of firms who take Bitcoin payments online for their goods. And they, they, they looked at the, the prices, for example, being charged by Overstock. And what they found, which I think surprised many people, was the cost to Bitcoin purchasers of goods on overstock was actually slightly less than what they'd pay if they paid using regular currency, which I think was a surprise to many um, um, for various reasons. And one I of the- I was going to say, just to mm -hmm. interrupt you, what, what were the reasons why those savings were, were oh, made? So, so that's the really interesting thing. So one of the, one of the explanations they, um, they, they suggested, although they need to do more testing to, to check this, was that merchants face lower risk of fraud when they take Bitcoin payments, because Bitcoin payments from consumers are immediate and final and can't be charged back. So whereas merchants run the risk that they will be subject to consumer fraud with credit card um, chargebacks, they're not subject to that with Bitcoin. And the observations of the, of the Boston Fed are, it seems that some merchants are sharing that saving with, with consumers. And, and the point to add to that is, well, okay, that's a fairly minor case um, in, 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 within a single country such as the US. But if you now look at international e-commerce, which is really quite modest in, in, in adoption because of the greatly increased risk of credit card fraud, um, it's potential that paying in something like Bitcoin or a similar push payment technology could enable cross-border retail um, um, consumer um, commerce that otherwise wouldn't happen at all. So, um, so really quite intriguing findings in that paper. So fascinating sort of scene setters from um, from our first two two comments there, Jay. But from the you know, from the coal face, if you like, from from the bank's perspective, what are the banks thinking about this now, and can they see beyond the negative into the positive? I think this is really challenging for banks uh, for three reasons. One, the regulatory questions are still turning around, and virtual currencies don't fit well within existing regulatory frameworks. So there's 
a lot of work going on and a lot of questions being asked, but um, nothing is clear yet. So for banks, this is challenging territory. I think number two, um, these, this technology potentially poses a, a competitive threat. And again, for banks, because it's early days to figure out what that threat is and what to do about it uh, is, is a challenge. And then number three, can banks potentially provide some sort of service to virtual currencies ultimately? And how might they monetize that and make that work? So it, I think you know, in, a, in a general sense, it's, it's very early days for banks. And, um, and they also have quite a few other things on their plate that they're worrying about. Uh, well, yes, exactly, and of course that's what tends to happen, doesn't it? When something creeps up on the outside lane, if you like, and you're concentrating so hard on the matter in hand, whatever it might be, and then something like this comes, a real innovation that perhaps people didn't see coming or didn't take seriously, and particularly from the regulator's point of view. Um, Jerry, I was struck by what you said about how banks, um, that, that these, uh, Bitcoin and, and other virtual currencies, don't fit in to existing regulatory frameworks, which of course would lead you, the, the obvious follow-up question is, well, f change the framework, but how easy is it to do that? Well, I think um, that the frameworks um, need to be adapted, but not thrown out. Um, and there are fundamentally, um, I think the, the right question to ask here is, well, what about the old framework um, doesn't work? And there are some, I think, very clear things um, about that. For example, there are some particular issues around storing of um, uh, uh, digital currencies. There are some particular issues around anti-money laundering, where traditional anti-money laundering systems are predicated around the fact that everyone will be going through a bank or another financial institution. and Therefore, the obligations are on those banks and financial institutions to do it. If there isn't a bank or financial institution on one side of um, the, the um, transaction, the old paradigm doesn't work. So, I mean, I think the right way to go about this, and we're seeing a lot of positive engagement from regulators around the world, is to just ask those very specific questions. What is it about this new technology um, that we actually can't apply the old methodologies to? Would you agree with that? I think so, and it, it's a great point that, that Adam makes that says, what is it about this new technology? And, and I think that's, it's important that we, we, we get that clear in our heads because something profoundly new has been in, invented here. Um, never before in history did we have the ability to transmit ownership of an asset at a distance without relying on some trusted third party, be it a bank or maybe the postman or the postwoman. And we now have that ability, thanks to, to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, to transfer ownership of assets at a distance with no third parties. So it, it has the potential to go beyond just payments and currency. Um, these, well, these I wanted mm. to ask you exactly that, Richard, if you wouldn't mind putting your, you know, looking into the, the crystal ball, mm. um, you know, where could it all lead, uh, if that's not an unfair question? Uh, so, so, the, so, so nobody knows for sure, but there, there are two, two areas of active research that I think are, are very promising. So the first is, well, what other types of assets might we want to transfer ownership of that today are difficult or expensive to transfer ownership of? So maybe securities and shares and bonds, they're quite difficult to transfer ownership today. They could be issued onto a system like Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency, and they may be easier for, for individuals and firms to move around. So there's a whole area of innovation there. But you can, and I know we're here at a, at a banking conference, but you can go outside finance and say, well, actually, this system is teaching us how to build new products and services that are very decentralized and where the dominant communication mechanism, if you like, is peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, so just an example of what, what we've recently announced at IBM, we've done some research into how would the Internet of Things, so this idea that homes will be connected, your fridge will be able to order the milk for you, how is that actually going to work in the future? How are we going to manage it and make sure these things still work in 20 years' time? And the conclusions that our research team have come to is, actually, maybe this needs to be very decentralized, very peer-to-peer. -peer. Maybe some of the technologies that were invented by Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies Maybe they could be applicable to securing and making the Internet of Things affordable in the future. So completely unrelated to, to finance, but new innovations that may otherwise have not been possible. And still involving that element of payment. If your fridge is ordering the milk, you're going to have to pay for that milk. Well, indeed. Way. So, yes. so fascinating. Yes. Stuff. Um, Jerry, what about banks? Can banks see opportunities to, to, to make money out of this? Well, I think one of the really fascinating things is that we started talking about 
currencies, virtual currencies, and then we started talking about virtual payment systems, and now we're starting to talk about asset tracking and other things. And the, I, as, um, as it's been said, I think the question is where, does it, where will it end up? And um, you know, possibly banks could lend some credibility and trust to a virtual currency by getting involved. I think that's an opportunity for virtual currencies and, and potentially for banks down the road once the regulatory questions become a bit clearer. And you think that clearly banks are not going to get involved until the regulation side of things is sorted out, which Adam brings me back to you. So you know, what, is there any sign that any regulator is, you know, we, we've already talked about how it doesn't fit into what's already existing and they're going to have to change it, but, but who's leading the charge on this? Who do we trust on this? Well, I mean, I think a lot of regulators are taking different approaches. There are some that are sort of taking an approach that, well, maybe it's better to let the market um, decide and let's warn consumers about the risks of doing this. And then you've got people like the New York Department of Services that have put out a bit license proposal about how you regulate that. And I think they deserve a lot of credit, actually, because they've just announced there'll be another round of comments that there are some things they didn't get right and um, it feels like they're engaging um, with um, this in the right way. But, I mean, I think there is a real question about, well, how do we persuade the banks to get involved? If you look at the history of payments on the internet, um, if we go back to 2000, uh, sort of 1994, um, you could have had the same sort of reports. Well, you can't do this securely. It's, um, everyone's getting ripped off. Um, it's, uh, there's no way this is safe and there's no market size. And really what I think was huge in that was for all the um, attention that people like PayPal got, was the banks actually allowing web-based transactional services. In 1995, Wells Fargo became the first large bank um, to actually start offering, in a limited and controlled way, transactional services over the web. And I think it would actually be good for the development of the technology and releasing its power for good to find a way to get some banks interested in dipping a toe in the water. Absolutely, we're down to our last few seconds, but Richard, would you agree with what Adam was just saying? Uh, yes, and, and I guess my, my guess maybe my advice on, on my call to the regulators is when framing the, these rules, bear in mind that we don't know the full potential of the technology, and the technology may not be used exclusively for financial purposes. So, um, so the, the, the risk we have to avoid, as well as the, the, the risks of the technology, are the risks that we artificially curtail it too soon in its development. Jerry, is it time for banks to stop being fearful and embrace instead? I think it's a time for banks to really spend time understanding how they could use the technology. And not just banks, financial market infrastructures, which is, which is where I'm from. Because there's, there's potential there that we need to understand and potentially use for future development. Absolutely, a call to arms there. Well, Jerry Gates, Richard Brown, Adam Shapiro, thank you very much for joining me on Cybos TV this afternoon. That's all we've got time for today. Um, thank you to all my guests, not just the three gentlemen to my left, um, who've informed, entertained, and explained so much to us on Cybos TV today. I'm Daisy McAndrew. Please join me and the team again tomorrow morning, 8.30, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Enjoy the rest of your day here at Cybos 2014.